What beauty, what a grace to be here in Petra. I am so happy to bring all of you with us here in this really cold desert uh, at this time of Lent. Now I wanted to explain where we are and why we're here. Petra actually comes from a word that they found when they first opened this place up with the excavations. They found a Nabataean script, um, a name, it's called Petrus, and it says Petrus was born in Rakim. And so this is also known as Rakim, and Rakim means stone or decorated stone, which is exactly what we see behind us. We've just walked in the main entrance of ancient Petra. And of course, you can imagine the reason that they made this place like this on the main road is so that they would impress people coming into this site. And so Petrus is the name that stuck to this place. Uh, like I said, it is known as Rakim. But also we have to remember um, this, according to the great historian Flavius Josephus, was a place where the Midianites lived when Moses was in this area or uh, in, when he was alive. And we have to remember that his wife was a Midianite. And so, of course, then was his family, his children. And so it's important, it's an important link to Moses. And we'll talk more about that as we go in to see the treasury up close. And so follow me as we go into this lovely, beautiful, ancient city. Really, I think it's the second on the modern list, or the, the list of the modern wonders of the world, uh, the seven wonders of the world. So let's go see it up close and we'll talk about the second commandment. Follow me. Carved into this sandstone cliff is this incredible edifice. As I mentioned coming in, it's called the treasury. And if you look closely at it, people always say, well, how is this thing carved? Well, their guide told us, of course, it's not something which was built or added into a rock face. It was built from the rock face. On either side of the edifice, you can see a little holes. It almost looks like a ladder. And those were ladders. They didn't have wood around here to make what we would consider, you know, the typical ladder. But they would use those as footholds to go all the way up and start carving from the top. And would also keep those steps as a way to maintain this place. And so it is a mausoleum. And I wanted to just tell you where we're standing right now, most people think, oh, that was the entrance height. No, no, the height of this is actually 30 feet below us. All of this is rock and sand and debris that just built up over time when the city was lost from the 800s until really the end of the 1800s, the beginning of the 1900s when they began to uncover this. And so um, what you found when archaeologists went in there were chambers that now are underground. And inside of those chambers they found a great Nabataean king. He was called uh, Arethas IV. And in fact, he was so important that his daughter married Herod the Great's, Herod the Great's son. And so there was this relationship with uh, you know, Herod over on the other side of the Jordan and here on this side of the Jordan. And we can't forget that Herod the Great was actually an Edomite. He was from this era, an Edomaean. And so this is why you know, he was kind of like, you know, is he really our king or is he not? So it was really interesting. But if you look at the facade, you can see a lot of decorations from different civilizations. Of course, those columns are Roman um, columns. You can see the, um, the triangle in the center has a face, which is kind of effaced at this point, but that's actually Medusa. Below on either side of the doors, you can see also some Greek figures. And then at the top, there's this round cylinder structure and there's a female figure that's actually Isis. And so you've got the Egyptian influence there. And at the very, very top, there were four huge eagles from this area. This would be more of a Nabataean religion, but also just a little bit further down on either side of the, of the Medusa, on one side and the other were winged lions, and that's typical of the Nabataeans. So again, this was a mausoleum, a um, monument to the great king of this area, and it was supposed to impress everyone that came through here to say, wow, these people are rich, these people are important. These people have a name in my book. In fact, whenever I come through here, I'm impressed. And so let's talk about that a little bit more when we go into the second commandment, which talks about keeping the Lord's name sacred.
So looking here at the treasury, it brings us to remember the second commandment that we've already started speaking about when it says, if we remind ourselves what Exodus 20 says and Deuteronomy says, do not take the Lord's name in vain. And so this is a place where they really wanted to make an impact in people who came in to be considered important. Now we have to remember that in the ancient world, um, genealogies were really important. In other words, names were really important to help know who the good guys were um, and distinguish them from the bad guys. In fact, this is um, nomenclature that Jeff Cavins uh, uses in his book um, talking about the great adventure of the Bible. He says it's kind of like knowing how to follow your soccer team because they have a specific type of jersey. But when we're talking about the good guys and the bad guys, we have to remember what we said regarding the covenant. There was a covenant in Adam and Eve. There was a covenant with Noah. There was a covenant um, also with Abraham. And so what we're doing in this is following the way that the Lord wants to save the entire human race. And so he decided to do that through the ancient Israelites and through who is guiding us in this pilgrimage, Moses. So that's why we're talking about names. So it helps us to know where the covenantal blessing is being passed down to, from father to son, and then to the whole family, and then eventually to a whole nation, and then of course, um, after Moses, to the entire world with Jesus Christ. So in the lives of the sons of God, which are the good guys, versus the lives of the sons of men, which in the Bible language means the Canaanites or any of the enemies of the ancient Israelites. So. I'm going to draw a parallel with another um, place where a big tower was built, and that was in Genesis 11. If you remember, that was the Tower of Babel, not too far from here, further east. And it was built so that people, this is specifically what it says, built so that they would make a name for ourselves. That's in Genesis 11, 4. And so in other words, they wanted to um, reach God is what it says, but to rebel against the covenant that God had made with Noah. And so if we look again then at name, in the biblical language of Hebrew, Shem is the word for name. And that means the firstborn. In fact, if you remember Noah, his firstborn son was actually named Shem. And so Shem was to receive the blessing of Noah when the Lord reestablished this covenant with the people again and again. So it means kingship and priesthood. And so um, one of Noah's sons tried to take that covenant from him. If you remember, we talked about that before, Ham. And so from Ham came all of the enemies of the ancient Israelites. So this is what we're trying to distinguish here and why it's important to keep this in mind when we're talking about the name of God and not taking it in vain. So Shem means I'm gonna take, I wanna make a Shem for myself or in the Tower of Babel, make a Shem so that people honor me. It's usurping this authority and in a certain sense, stepping away from, like stepping out of that covenantal relationship, not letting God be God. So you remember what happened to the people at Babel um, when God came down and saw all of this. They were scattered. Sin and rebellion sends people to division and exile. The same thing that happened to the people, to the Israelites um, many times in their history and when they were in, in Egypt. So this is what we're talking about when we're talking about Shem. So the line of Shem is a new beginning in the Old Testament. And that's why just kind of an interesting thing, Shem is the, the root word for Semite, because all of them were Semites or from the line of Shem. And I also want to remind you that um, from Shem, one of his most important descendants was actually Abraham from the line of Shem. And so this whole story is Abraham, he is going to be a faithful, and then Moses comes, is he going to be faithful to the covenant? So it's within this entire dynamic. So all of this talks or points us back to that second commandment of taking the Lord's name in vain. And particularly, it talks about false oaths or false promises. Oaths have whew, a lot of depth to them. We could go into that. In fact, in some of our um, material that we'll send along with this video, you can read more about Old Testament oaths and the different dimensions that go along with that. But really what we're talking about is taking God as a witness to what we are affirming. This is when we say, I swear to God, I swear to God. So my pledge is equal to the truthfulness of God. And that is a big thing to say. In fact, it even says in Deuteronomy 6 to swear by his name, to swear by his name. So this helps us to remember we should never 
enter into an oath um, lightly. And certainly a false oath is something which is extremely problematic. God is the norm of all truth. Now, even to say that in today's world is difficult because um, as the late Benedict XVI uh, said, we're living in a relative uh, tyranny of relativism. It's difficult for people to go back and say there's actually um, a foundation for almost anything. But we know that God is the foundation of truth. He actually says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the truth. And so he looks for mankind to be fulfilled. And in the truth of who we are, we are fulfilled. And so that's why it's important to remember this. Oaths highlight the relationship between our human speech and the word. In other words, the word that created the universe, the word that created this beautiful canyon, the word that became flesh. God is the truth. So a false oath calls God to witness to a lie. And that goes against not only his nature, but it goes against our nature. One example that is really easy to think about is perjury. It's kind of common. We almost expect people to lie even when they place their hands on the Bible. It's really common today for people to say, I don't want to place my hand on the Bible. Let me place my hand on something else. Again, because of that relativism, where is the foundation of truth? Well, perjury means that there's a great lack of respect for the word, the Lord of all speech. Now, I'm going to take us to the fulfillment, again, the fulfillment of Moses, uh, the fulfillment of the Ten Commandments on the Sermon on the Mount. There, Jesus explained the second commandment, saying this, you have heard that it was said, this is from Matthew 5, to the men of old, you shall not swear falsely, said Jesus, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not swear at all. Let what you say simply be yes or no. Anything more than this comes from the evil one. So Jesus is teaching that every oath involves a reference to God, as we said, and particularly it's a reference to God's presence. And his truth must be honored in all speech. I swear to God, boom, he's there. What do we want him to witness? The truth in what we're saying, the truth in what we're swearing to, the truth of our promises and our oaths, or, we, or are we asking him to change his nature and to be who he is not and say, back up my lie back up this, this uh, twisted uh, speech. So it's, the second commandment is actually pretty incredible. And really you can ask yourself, so what? So what if I would lie? What if I would break my oath? Well, perjury is certainly against the law, but you can go even further than that since this is all in the context of covenant. What happened to Adam and Eve when they broke the covenant? What happened to Noah? What happened to Babel? Division and exile, we said. Slavery is not a happy thing. And slavery is what we're trying to get out of. And that's what the commandments are tooting us toward. So don't use the Lord's name for trivial matters, I think is what this commandment is telling us. We are speaking on God's authority. Never take an oath when required for purposes contrary to the dignity of persons, because again, this is the whole point. This is what the Lord is looking for. And certainly we should never take an oath which compromises the unity of Christians. That's something which again goes against our dignity and against the whole nature of God. I just want to add one other thing that I think this commandment points us to when we think about the different names of this place, Petras, Re Rechem, and those are Christian names. You know, um, the very typical moment when we think about Christian names uh, and in the light of the second commandment uh, is during baptism. So what is this person christened as? Or what is the name? Actually, that's one of the questions that's asked in baptism. What is this child's name? And so there was usually, uh, especially in the past, a requirement that the names given would be Christian names. And it's interesting because we even start with in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So we are within the very name of the Lord. As we have said before, you know, we take that name every time we sign ourselves, we're actually speaking about the Lord's name. So what does it matter if a child receives the same name at baptism or not? Well, the saints are actually patrons of certainly of a way of life. And so they can also be, we believe this very much in um, the Catholic Church and the Church triumphant 
that uh, they are patrons and they are those who help protect those people during their lives. So the sense of a Christian name is important. I love the um, Irish tradition of placing a Christian name as the middle name or the, or the third, second middle name, the third name of a child, because it puts them under the protection of these great saints. So we just have to be careful not to use the Lord's name in vain in the sense of giving someone a name that is foreign to Christian sentiment. And finally, just to remember that, and this is Isaiah 43, the Lord calls each of us by name. And because of that, even like uh, insults to others, uh, speaking badly of others, everyone is sacred. And so names demand respect as a sign of the dignity of one, the one who holds it. In fact, remember what it says in the kingdom, the mysterious and unique character of each person marked with God's name will shine forth in splendor. And that's what it uh, says actually at the very end of the Bible. And this is what I wanted to just end with. It says in Revelation 2 and also in Revelation 14, it says, To him who conquers, I will give a white stone with a new name written on the stone, which no one knows except him who receives it. And then jumping to verse 14, or chapter 14 in Revelation, it says, Then I looked, and lo, on Mount Zion stood the Lamb, and with him 144,000, who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. So these are the different dimensions and nuances, I think, of this part of the second commandment. And so let's remember and pray with the psalm, O Lord our God, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You know, walking through this canyon uh, today, I was like, oh Lord our God, how majestic you are, all of your creation. And he's like, yes, how majestic is your name over all the earth. That's in Psalm 8. So if you'd like to pull out your own personal Ten Commandments, we are still on that very first tablet. And I'd like to offer a couple of reflections for today. Just to reflect on your own oaths, perhaps sometimes we can be very flippant in what we promise or what we swear by. Are we asking God to be a guarantor of what we promise? Or sometimes when we share or make an oath, are we asking God to, um, to be a guarantor of something which is more self-seeking or a lie or a power play? So we can, we can look at that and say, okay, Lord, how do I want to, uh, to recognize and make your name majestic? Am I making a power play for myself outside of God's plan that happened here with the Moabites? And then secondly, very simply, um, you can even write on your little tablet how you use the sign of the cross, the sign of the cross which blesses in God's name everything that I do during the day and the beginning of my day. It's actually calling upon his name and asking not only for him to witness but to give us the strength to live according to the dignity of the sons and daughters of God. And also, do you know the uh, patron saint behind your name? how they can protect you or those that you love. These are all wonderful things to think about as we try to get the Egypt out of ourselves and move forward into freedom. So let's go further into Petra and all over this beautiful desert area as we follow the footsteps of Moses and make our way into freedom. So God bless you. Know that we're praying for you from the Holy Land and we hope to see you again tomorrow.